Before we dive in, tell us a bit about yourself, guys. Let's start with you, Ram. Uh, my name is uh, Ram Velaga. Um, I run the switching and routing uh, Ethernet business at uh, Broadcom. And last couple of years, I've really been fighting the Ethernet versus Infinity ba Band battle. Excellent. Ray? I'm Ray Moda. I'm CEO and principal analyst for ACG. And we focus primarily on the service provider space and the large enterprise, doing a lot of work on research, but economic modeling as well. Ethernet, it's been a hot topic lately. <laughs> it has, indeed. Uh, so let's jump uh, right in. Ram, uh, I'm going to start with you. Uh, at your most recent AI virtual event, uh, you talked about InfiniBand versus the Ethernet, yeah. but I think you really set the context properly by talking about the importance of the network, uh, especially in today's AI clusters and AI workloads and work with AI applications. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, if you think about AI, uh, right, in the f first thing you have to think about is it's a distributed computing problem. And what I mean by a distributed computing problem is you cannot take an you know, AI workload and run it on one GPU, no matter how big your GPU is. Somebody today can come and say they have the fastest GPU. Two years from now, they can come and say they have something that's even faster. But the reality is any particular GPU or accelerator is only as big as what a TSMC can build or you know, advanced packaging that you can do or the fastest HBM you can put on. But really what you need for a machine learning or an AI workload is many tens of thousands of these GPUs all acting together as if they're one very, very large computer, right? right? To do that, you really have all of these to be tied together and all of these have to be networked together. Right. And that's what we mean by, you know, this is a distributed computing problem. When you have a distributed computing problem, the network is what ties all of this together and the network becomes the computer. Right. Because anyone can build the fastest GPU, but if they cannot tie all of these GPUs together to act as if they're one large piece of single computer, the whole thing falls apart. And that's what we mean by the network is the computer. And you know, if network is the computer and you want to build the best network that's out there, there's nothing like Ethernet. Uh, there was a finding from Meta, which I thought was really uh, uh, insightful uh, that you highlighted in your talk. Uh, can you tell us what that uh, finding was about the, how the network is critical for making sure that these GPUs don't stay idle? So um, I, I don't know if you've seen this uh, presentation, which was presented by Meta, uh, I believe, about a couple of years ago at the OCP. And what they showed is um, different um, uh, workloads that they had, different kinds of recommendation models that they had, and how much time was spent uh, in the network, the traffic going back and forth between these GPUs. And it varied anywhere from 20% to almost 57%. Right. What it means is there is that much amount of time, somewhere between 20 to 50, almost 60% of the time, the GPUs are sitting idle, waiting That's, for the traffic yeah. to be shuffled yeah. between these different GPUs, right? Now, so think about it. Typically, these GPUs probably sell between twenty to $30,000, depending on how favorite a customer you are. Sometimes the more. Vendor. Sometimes, Sometimes more, more. A lot yeah. more. <laughs> now, right. you know, and then you take those and you're now putting together 100,000 of this. You do the math. That's anywhere between two to three plus billion dollars in GPUs. Right. And if these things are sitting idle, that's a pretty expensive I mean, affair. You talk about a billion yeah. dollars, right? Yeah. Like yeah. 50%. Yeah. yeah, so if you say 50% of the time you're sitting idle, you're sitting, you know, about a billion and a half sitting idle there. Yeah. yeah. And in that same uh, uh, study, Meta actually, they built two different clusters, one with Ethernet, and we can talk about now Ethernet versus InfiniBand. Look, I think, you know, uh, two years ago, if you talk to anybody, they said, if you're building a GPU, you know, cluster, AI machine learning, nothing other than InfiniBand would right, work. Right, I remember. Yeah. Right? It was everywhere you went, it's like, oh, if it's not InfiniBand, this is not going to work. And I was sitting there scratching my head saying, that's not true, right? right? Today, when you look at it, Top seven, seven out of the top eight largest clusters in the world are built based on Ethernet. Yep. There is one last remaining one that's built on, you know, InfiniBand. But my take is, you know, in a year, year and a half from now, that will also be based on Ethernet. Okay. So what's happened over this two-year period is, you know, initially when you get a solution that's kind of all purpose built by the vendor and they says, okay, look, you cannot touch any of this. You've got the GPU, you've got the NIC, you've got these cables and you've got the switches and all of this is pre-engineered by us. If you touch it, the thing is not going to work. 
there is a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt based on which the customers who are in a rush to deploy these systems right. will just take it as somebody is giving it to them, right? But then as customers start to deploy them, they'll start to find out, look, operationally, InfiniBand is very different than Ethernet. Number two, it has a tendency to just literally, you know, break down quite quite a bit more than just Ethernet has been built for because Ethernet is built under the notion that it is going to be very scalable, reliable, and so on and so forth. So customers have gone through these experiences and said, look, I have to actually benchmark InfiniBand versus mm -hmm. Ethernet mm -hmm. to see if it is worth this hassle of maintaining this InfiniBand, which is very, you know, fragile. Right. Right? And they started to test and, you know, uh, uh, Meta put out this paper. They did over 24,000 plus GPUs wow. and they tested them both and they found out Ethernet was pretty good. It was actually in many cases very comparable mm -hmm. performance to InfiniBand, mm -hmm. but with the operational ease and reliability that right. you expect out of, you know, Ethernet. So, there's more and more benchmarks that have been done across the industry, and that's why the industry has moved on to internet. Right. Yeah, and I think there's, I mean, there's history here too. I mean, right. in the past, I mentioned when I was a former CTO, I loved ATM technology. Because yes. you said <laughs> slice yes. and dice the data. I mean, we had triple play back then, but I remember designing trading floors and stuff like that. And my boss came over and said, I want you to try these broker workstations with Ethernet. And I'm like, Ethernet, are you kidding me? We have ATM and we make a lot anywhere of like that, right? <laughs> but, but then our CFO came in, hey, it's uh, $1,200 a NIC car for an ATM 25 meg, and it's $69 for 100 <laughs> meg. At, at price. <laughs> right, and, and, and I was like, so I learned the economics part of network design, but initially, I was concerned about the architecture of the Ethernet, but it just kept getting better, better speeds and that efficiency. So I learned early on never to get bet against Ethernet from that perspective. Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, the ubiquity of Ethernet. Yeah, the ubiquity makes is it. there. So, yeah. so from an economics standpoint, maybe you do you want to comment a bit more? I know that you did a study recently, right? Of, uh, sure. Yeah. The economics and, of Ethernet. And and for those who don't know, what we do is we have um, a software platform that's kind of like a digital twin, but it does economic simulation modeling of whatever architecture versus any architecture, any technology versus any technology or any use case or application for that perspective. So what we did in this particular case was we model Ethernet uh, against InfiniBand, and then we use a similar architecture where we use spine leaf technologies, right. and we had a server environment where we had the DGX8, I think the H100s, um, and, and from that perspective, we had the server environment, but then we had a compute network that we had in Finiband, but then we had, in this case, the Juniper, the QFX uh, switches from that. And then the interconnection range between 400 to 800 gig. And honestly, some of the findings from a CapEx perspective is about 55%, because even the ports on Infiniband itself are twice as expensive sure. as an Ethernet so port. So 50% for cheaper for Ethernet yes. compared to Infiniband. Yes, 50% so cheaper. So less than half the Yeah, cost. and then when we looked at some of the other parts from the switching cost. Then we looked at the equipment cost, which a lot of people forget, cables, optics, okay. that adds up over time, and there's different requirements. And then the second part is the OPEX. Right. How much does it cost to manage this environment? And this is where we model you know, intent-based automation with AppStrip to say, how do we simplify? So the overall TCO came out to about 56% savings over a three-year time frame right now. Wow. So we're talking about the same performance, uh, better reliability, and more than half of the cost. But then to get to performance, I think that another also critical uh, factor is management, right? Debuggability, observability, yep, yeah, yeah. right? And in the ecosystem of tools, yep. right? Yeah. Um, you know, knowing what's going wrong in the cluster and or fine tuning a cluster to make sure that the parameters are all set properly from a networking standpoint, uh, is also very important. Knowing what's going on on the you know on the link you know on the wire yep. is important, right. and you know for Ethernet, I, you know there are hundreds and thousands of tools out there. Tools. Of course, we built one uh, Abstra, uh, now part of uh, Juniper, uh, which works across all, all types of vendors. Uh, but there are many, many such tools on the market. Yeah. You know, I suspect that that's also a factor compared to yeah, InfiniBand. I don't know how many tools there are yeah. for to go and debug or provide observability into, into InfiniBand. I suspect that was a yeah, factor in your study. That was a major factor. I mean, there's, we, we focus mostly on tangible benefits, yeah. but there's a lot of intangible benefits associated with it where when there's only one vendor 
you're at the mercy of their timeline and their priorities, not yours, right? So that's a challenge, right? The other part is the number of skill sets that are available out there to be able to support exactly. something that's yep. uh, set up this way and stuff like that, where if you look at, I talked about just the cost of the equipment, look at the cost of the skill sets skill set. that you have yep. to acquire. You normally, when you interview an engineer, you don't ask if they have ethernet skills, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? So I think those are the intangibles that people aren't thinking about. How much is it to the skill sets to maintain? Because that adds up to operational costs. And more importantly, I'm more concerned about business continuity. Because realize we're talking about AI, but some of these models could be used for high performance computing or whatever parallel processing that requires that type of uh, uh, environment and stuff like that. So there's a variety of use cases what? on top of AI for that. Yeah, concern. I mean, I can yeah. imagine that uh, an organization has multiple yeah, networks, multiple and networks, the more right. commonality there yeah. are in these networks, the better in terms yeah. of leveraging the workforce, Correct, the yeah. expertise. Also, there are some security aspects, uh, right, Ram? Yeah, yeah, so let's talk about security, right? So for example, now specifically when you think about AI, AI coming into the you know enterprises, yeah, what do enterprises have that's really differentiated? That is their own customer data, their own analytics, you know, how their whole business runs. And a lot of that is very proprietary. And some of it is so fundamental that they're not necessarily maybe going to feel very comfortable putting it outside their own premise. Mm -hmm. Now, so they start to build their, you know, private AI cloud, so to say. When they start building it, what needs to happen is there's a lot of data that goes back and forth between what is stored in their cold storage, active storage, and into the GPUs, doing the data analysis, crunching out some you know, coefficients, and then pushing it out. So what this means is it has to come into the natural security policies you have already inside your enterprise, and how things are being stored, right. secured, who do you give access to what, mm -hmm. so and so forth. So if you build something with something like InfiniBand, which doesn't have this notion of access controls, mm -hmm. you know, security, and right. so on and so forth, you're going to be building completely different islands. And the whole idea of building something that's private you know, into your enterprise and moving data back and forth is not going to work. Right. Which is yeah. where kind of yeah. having everything on Ethernet, one common fabric, one common set yeah. of policies, some, one common set of access yeah. controls, right? Just makes all of this so much I mean, more easy. No, I was going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm actually glad you brought that up because not enough people are talking about the security yeah. aspects of it because I always say security is as strong as your weakest link, right? And then having the more distributed you have security, the harder it is to manage and more opportunities for penetration. And you don't want to have these dead pockets where people don't have understanding of what's yeah. going on in that area. So I always say no security, no business. Excellent. Um, We've said that Ethernet uh, provides similar performance the, to, than InfiniBand. Maybe tell us about UEC. There is an effort, right? I think it's about mm -hmm. uh, improving the scalability of RDMA specifically, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, do you want to tell us maybe a bit about you know, the purpose for UEC and how it's going to scale Ethernet to the, uh, even further? So while Ethernet today does everything that InfiniBand does, you know, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, get going, better performance, much higher reliability, less than half the cost, we're all kind of thinking ahead about how do you improve RDMA, not Ethernet, mm -hmm. but how do you improve right. RDMA? And that's where UEC has come up with a bunch of improvements to RDMA that allow it to do multipathing. So you don't assume there's just one path between point A and point B, that there's multiple paths. Then you have efficient, you know, retransmits, which is, if packet four got dropped, but five, six, and seven got transmitted, we will go back and only retransmit packet four right. rather than transmitting five, Don't. six, and seven. Right. So it's built under the assumption that your underlying fabric might actually fail rather than InfiniBand and RDMA that said underlying fabric will not fail, will not right? Fail. right? So yeah. you build resiliency, you know, knowing failures will happen. Otherwise, it's like, hey, building in, you know, a skyscraper in San Francisco saying there will be no earthquake, yep. right? That's a ridiculous assumption right. to make. Right. Assume there's earthquakes and retrofit the buildings. Yep. And that's what, you know, is Excellent. There's going to be a large ecosystem around it and multiple uh, topology options, right? Yep. Like where you can involve the NIC or you may just uh, work within the confines of the, the switches, yep. correct? Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, that was insightful and lots of fun. Thank you very much.